scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast <clears throat> that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Good to see all of you. Always a delight to be able to assemble with you. Before I begin the sermon, I meant to say this during the announcements, but uh, Brother Kevin Pearson is supposed to speak tonight, but because of the events of the past week um, that involved this congregation with a funeral and, and the fire behind us, um, I'm not going to Memphis until early Tuesday morning. And so I'm going to preach tonight, and Brother Kevin... I'll be off in a speaking appointment on the 14th of April, and he'll preach that Sunday night. So we're not putting him off. He, he hasn't backed out. He's not afraid to speak. He's prepared. And last time he was prepared to, to speak, we had cold weather, and the Sunday night service was canceled. And so um, in case somebody misreads that, it's not Kevin postponing it. It's just things, events have happened that have delayed things, and he's gracious to to adjust to that, but um, we are looking forward to, to him speaking. As we think about the resurrection of Christ, as was read to us, the very essence of the good news of the gospel absolutely depends on it. So there's some realities that are involved in the resurrection that we need to pay real close attention to. We need to understand and that there were preparation made. This wasn't an accidental thing. This, this wasn't something that uh, was an afterthought. This was something that was always planned before the foundation of the earth, that we would have a resurrected Savior. Now, we had to have a Savior. From the sin in the garden and the removal from the tree of life, there was a need for a Savior. So this passage that Paul is writing to these Corinthian Christians, he pulls their mind back together and say, here is the essence of it. Don't forget what you've heard and what you have received and wherein you stand and by which you are saved. But he made sure that they knew this was according to the Scriptures. The very essence of their belief was because of the Scriptures. There's only one way for our faith in the Lord to arrive. According to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, those scriptures remind us that God had a plan. And there's some realities about the resurrection that oftentimes men miss. It was prophesied. In fact, when you go back to that very first sermon that was preached after Christ's ascension back to the Father, after His resurrection, those things were pulled together on that Pentecost day. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, wanted to make sure that, that they knew what this was all about. This good news that was being shared was shrouded in their rejection of the Messiah. And you see, when that death occurred, though it had been prophesied, and though the very essence of the good news of salvation for us was dependent upon it, as Brother Joe pointed out in our preparation to partake the communion, we need to understand that Christ died for us, that we deserve being there, and He died for us. But the empowerment of that sacrifice is absolutely dependent upon His resurrection. He has to be raised, or He can't be our Savior. And yet there were those who are witness his crucifixion. 
who stood beneath that cross and saw him fulfill all the prophecies concerning the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. But they didn't see him as that lamb that would die and would be raised. They thought that was it. And when you read Luke chapter 24, you have people coming out with the intentions of anointing, preparing for burial, showing respect to a lifeless body. And when they arrive at that tomb with that expectation, they didn't anticipate it would be empty. And though all the prophecies spoke of it. And the angel then appeared to those women and said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. And all sorts of things started happening after that. And different ones came and to see if that tomb really was empty. And then people are walking along like the men from Emmaus. And, and they're talking about this resurrection. And the, what's happened and the tomb is empty. And Jesus joins them. They don't recognize Him. And what's this all about? And they rehearse with Him. You know, this, this tomb is empty. And Jesus said to them, Are you so foolish? That you don't recognize what the Scripture said? So when Paul says to these folks, the Scripture is recorded. The very essence of the good news you've received is that the Scripture is recorded that He would die, that He would suffer, that He'd be raised again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now this resurrected Savior... Spent about 40 days with these disciples. And he told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power on high. And so they were making this, he was making this preparation for them to go and share this good news that Paul was talking about. This salvation that they had heard about and received and were saved by. That's what's going on here with, with Jesus preparing them to carry this message. So the prophecies concerning that resurrection was part of that very first sermon. And Peter stood up with the eleven in verse 22 of chapter 2. He said, And ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and signs and wonders, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So while Jesus was here, he confirmed that he was the Son of God because of the power that he demonstrated. It said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have lawless hands have crucified and slain, whom God, listen, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Not possible. That you can hold the Son of God in the tomb. So it took the Son of God to be that perfect sacrifice on the cross, that Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, but it took that Son of God, loosening the pains, the chains of death, in order for us to have that hope. So the reality of the resurrection is that there was a preparation made. As Peter continues with those, he mentions to them, not only has he been loose the, the pains of death, but verse 25 said, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Listen. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. The preparation that was made was the Holy One, Christ Himself, would have to die, would have to be that sacrifice to save us. But he would not be left in that tomb. His flesh would not remove, would not remain in that 
tomb and be corrupted. Verse 27 says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to seek corruption, thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now Peter said, Men and brethren, we freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So lest they get confused about the preparation that was made, lest they get confused about the resurrection that's being talked about here, being prophesied of all the way back in, in Psalm 16 and verse 10. He's saying David wasn't talking about David. When David talked about, you will not leave my, my soul in, in hell or Hades, and my flesh won't see corruption. He would say, David is still in the tomb. His flesh did see corruption. His, fe his flesh did decay like all other men's flesh. So who is he talking about? The reality of the resurrection is, he wasn't talking about David. Even David speaking these and prophesying these things, he wasn't talking about himself. He said, you can visit his sepulcher today. He told those folks on Pentecost, and verse 30 said, Therefore, being a prophet, there's a preparation, the prophet saying, this is what's going to happen. And being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. There's a preparation made. Christ is going to be raised. Always intended to be raised. Going to demonstrate that power. Verse 31 said, Seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Then he said, This Jesus, this Jesus, that demonstrated all of his power by his miraculous deed, this Jesus, that you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. This Jesus that David prophesied would be of his loins and would be raised from the, from the grave. This Jesus had God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Now that's what Paul is talking about in the passage that Brother Tommy read for us. He said, I want to remind you of what you heard. Because what the Corinthians heard was what these in Acts chapter 2 heard. This is the essence of the good news. Preparation was made by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he had to be raised. And as he underscores these things to these people, verse 36 said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know it surely that God had made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the reality of the resurrection is, that was a preparation made for our salvation. A sacrifice had to be offered that was pure, and innocent, without sin. And so he died for us. But that death, that death would have just been another death had it not been for the resurrection. And that's the essence of it all. And so that preparation was made. And, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you drop down to verse 22 and following, there was a designation made about the resurrection. That Paul's saying, you've received this, this good news about your salvation, that's hinged upon what the Scripture said about the resurrection. And you get to verse 22 of that context, and he said... For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Just let that sink in a little bit. As in Adam all die. Adam was that first man who was separated from the tree of life and started that physical dying process. Because he had spiritually died when he disobeyed God. So that's where the dying process started. But notice what he contrasts here. For every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, 
Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he hath, met, when he hath put down all rule and all authority, for he must reign until he had put all things under his feet. Now listen, verse 26. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. How do you destroy death? Now see, they went out on that early first day of the week to acknowledge death. To anoint a lifeless body. But he wasn't there. There was no body to anoint. And the angel declared, he is not here. So the first grave that was empty, never to be occupied again, is this grave that housed the body of our Lord. He's risen. Now, there are a lot of people thinking about the resurrected Christ today, and that's a fabulous thing, isn't it? As Brother Joe pointed out, we get to be reminded of Christ's sacrifice for us every first day of the week. That's empowered by His resurrection. But do we think about it daily that these Corinthian Christians being encouraged, don't forget the hope that you have. You see in verse 19, just before the passage we read just a moment ago, Paul said, if in this life only we have hope, we are above all men most miserable. You know why? Because this life is it. When we get to the tomb, that's it. There's no place else to go. We used up our time and our existence, that's it. But he's writing to people who have hope in Christ Jesus because the tomb's empty. Christ has been raised. He now sits at the right hand of God and just like Adam started that dying process, Christ, by having that power over the grave, taking away the power of death, now gives us that beginning process of life. We can live forever. Not possible without His resurrection. Notice He said, it begins with Christ and then those of us who are in Christ. Then cometh the end. The end? Then cometh the end of all things. What then? Ah, those who are raised in Christ Jesus get to live with Him eternally in that place that He's preparing for them. We don't have time to look at that, but that, that designation was dealt with by the Lord Himself when He had this conversation with His disciples in John chapter 10. And he emphasized that he, he came that they might have life and that life was in him and life did not exist without in him. And he said, it is my life. It's my life that I lay down. No man takes it from me. Now those who stood beneath the cross thought there were a lot of people who took his life. The Jewish authorities took his life. The Roman officials and guards and soldiers took his life. But Jesus said, you need to understand the designation that the, the resurrection has. No man takes my life. I lay it down. But you know what he said in John chapter 10 and verse 17? And I'll raise it up. I don't have that power. Now, I do everything I can to try to be healthy and prolong my days and want to exist here as long as I can, but I am limited about what I can do. My physical life could end like that. There's not a thing I can do about it. Ah, but the hope I have in Christ. The one who laid his life down on purpose, consciously, designated it as the sacrifice for me was the one who had the power to raise it up for me so that I have hope. Because if only in this life I have hope, there's a lot of misery to have, isn't it? 
lot of sadness. We shared in a funeral this week. Of, we walked as far as we could with Sister Janice Jenkins, and that's it. We stand by a graveside like we stand by other people's graveside. That's as far as we can walk with her. That's it. But you see, what I read by her graveside was the essence of what Jesus was saying. Nobody's going to take my life from me. I'm going to lay it down. But I'm also going to raise it up. I have the power to raise it up. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, John heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Henceforth they shall rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. It sounds like there's something beyond dying, doesn't it? But why? Paul says it's because of the good news of the gospel. What they'd heard, what they'd received, wherein they stood, and by which they were saved, if, if they keep in memory what had been preached unto them. You and I have to keep in memory the realities of the, of the resurrection. And when Jesus spoke to Mary and Martha, particularly with Martha, He asked her about her resurrection. The resurrection. She said, well, I know. That I know that He's going to be raised on the last day. Talking about the judgment day. And Jesus said, No, I am the resurrection. Try to put your mind around that. I am the resurrection. That preparation has been made is because there's a designation that He is empowering us with a way out of this life. And then you see in chapter 15 and verse 54 and following through 57 that there is a declaration made. <clears throat> we need to understand what that means. In verse 54 he said, <clears throat> For when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and the mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a marvelous thought. Though this book continues through chapter 16, we would say, if we listened to Paul's sermon, boy, that's a, a real climactic way to end the sermon, isn't it? Here's the hope that we have in Christ and the fear of death has been taken away and the dread of those things have been removed and thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. The declaration is the essence of the good news is because of the resurrection of Christ. That's what His declaration proclaims. That's what it's all about. That's what gives us hope. That's why we don't have to fear death. Because the death is not the end for those in Christ Jesus. But the part sometimes we leave out is the demonstration of the reality of the resurrection. That's our part. All the other we've talked about is, is the Lord's part. It was it's prepared ahead of time. He's coming as a sacrifice. And He's going to be empowered. He does have the power to lay down His life. But He also has the power to raise up His life. And He does that. For us. Now what do I do in return? Paul said to the Corinthians, here's how you demonstrate you believe in the resurrection. That you believe in the resurrected one. That you believe in the one who is the resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren, because of all that's been said about this good news of the gospel and the resurrection and the hope that we have in Him and the fear of death has been taken away, because of all that, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, what do you mean not in vain in the Lord? Because He lives. We're not just honoring someone who died. 
we're honoring and obeying someone who lives. He's resurrected. And our labor then is not in vain because we acknowledge Him and He's preparing a place for us. When you pull all those together in Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, Paul said, Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What? Listen carefully to it. If we're going to abound in the work of the Lord, then that means we have to be in the Lord. How do we get there? What? Know ye not that many of us that are baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You see all that being pulled together? The power and might of the Eternal One breaking the, the bonds of death and giving us hope beyond the grave? Now we submit to Him. We join Him in that burial. We get to also join Him in that resurrection. That like as Christ was raised up from the grave, from the dead, even so, even so, likened unto that, we shall walk in newness of life. That's how we abound in the work of the Lord. That's how we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because it's through His power, the shedding of His blood, that our sins are washed away and we get to be raised with Him to walk a new life. That's how we demonstrate the resurrection. By being resurrected people who live different kind of lives than we used to live because of Him. It ought to inspire us. It ought to encourage us. And when we hear people say, He's risen, we ought to say, Amen to that. Let me tell you about the resurrected one. Let me tell you what a resurrected life is all about and why we ought to do everything we do because of Him so we can glorify Him because we know that our labor is not in vain in Him. Those of, of us who are in Him need to be reminded of something. Paul said, of Himself. The one who wrote not only Romans and how we have our sins washed away and our burial with Christ, and we rise to walk in newness of life, but the one who wrote to the Corinthians and said, I want to remind you of the gospel. Writing to Christian folks, I want to remind you of that good news and what that means to you. What the scriptures are talking about. And what your response ought to be. The truth, the reality of the preparation that was made. The designation that it was accomplished in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And that declaration that the power of the grave has been taken away. The sting of death is removed. That we ought to demonstrate our acknowledgement of that by saying thanks be to God who gives us the victory. And then we ought to demonstrate that in our lives. But Paul said of himself in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. So there's that, that death part. Got to, do, got to put myself to death so I can live for Him. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, notice the contrast. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. What a marvelous thought. None of that's possible. Listen to me. None of that's possible. The good news evaporates if He is not risen. We didn't have time to deal with it, but you want an interesting study, go back and read that whole chapter where Paul rehearses all the witnesses who saw the resurrected Savior. That ought to motivate folks. That's why he said, don't you forget what you've been taught. Don't you forget who you serve. Don't you forget. May each of us be inspired.
by the resurrection of Christ this morning. May we demonstrate our, the reality of our understanding of that by living resurrected lives. And you can do that this morning. We've told you how to do that this morning. Will you do that? While together we stand and while we sing.